So uh, again, Stephen Green had come to the uh, my studio. At, at, I think it was number six Bleecker Street, Bleecker in the Bowery, and I had just shown him my my work, and I thought it was really good abstract expressionist painting. <clears throat> I mean, it had impressed people in art and design. It impressed people in Kansas City. I knew I was good. And what he said changed my life. It really literally changed my life. He said, is this what you want to do for the rest of your life? He, I said, huh? He said, do you want to be like a 10th generation abstract expressionist? You're so young. Don't you think you got to find your own voice? And that blew me away because he was absolutely correct. Holy shit. I mean, I was, I, at the time, I was, I was annoyed, I was pissed. I thought, what does he know? My work's great. But the more I thought about it, and the more, you know, I began to understand that, you know, abstract expressionists did their thing from Gorky through Pollock through the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. <clears throat> I mean, I think I admire Joan Mitchell as much as I admired Pollock and de Kooning. De Kooning was my favorite painter, but I certainly like Michael Goldberg. I mean, in high school, I had uh, I had met in high school. I met some incredible people. Uh, which, I, frankly, I didn't even understand at the time. Like, I met uh, my English teacher was a woman named Daisy Alden, who was a poet. And Daisy assigned us to read these bizarre surrealist works by this obscure writer named Aeneas Nin. And Aeneas Nin would come and lecture us. So we got to meet Aeneas Nin. One of the things Daisy Alden um, assigned to us was something called the New Folder. The New Folder was a book, a, a, a compilation of illustrations by Jane Freilicher, Helen Frankenthaler, Michael Goldberg, uh, poems by Frank O'Hara, uh, Kenneth Coach, uh, kind of like the New York, New York art vis-a-vis um, the, uh, the, the visual arts and poetry. And Daisy had a poem in there probably, I don't even remember. Uh, I've always, like, remember I told you to get that, uh, that, uh, what's his name, uh, Conversations with Artists, Selden Rodman book. The other great book is Daisy Alden's New Folder, which uh, I think I got a copy, I have to get another copy. Um, at any rate, I, I love those guys, and I was doing my own version of it, and what Stephen said to me rang true. Um, I was borrowing, even though I admired those guys, and I realized that I wanted to find my own voice. I wanted to find something else. I wanted to find something new. And that culminated for me in, uh, I mean, what happened right after that meeting with Stephen. Um, I got a job working uh, for a frame shop on 60th Street, 61st Street and 1st Avenue. And uh, I went to work one day in that period, 1963, <clears throat> November. And uh, I got to work, and my boss was crying, an old man. Uh, I was kind of horrified, and I said, what, what the hell's the matter with you? And he said, Kennedy's been shot. And I said, so what? Why do you care? I'm thinking, John Kennedy was the head art critic for the New York Times, very unpopular. So the guy said to me, not Kennedy, you idiot, John Kennedy, the president, which blew me away.
I mean, I, I idolized John Kennedy. I thought he was uh, an inspiration. <coughs> you know, ask not what you can do for your country. Ask what your country, you know. When ask not what you, your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. It was all about service. And, you know, my take on making art is it's service. You're serving mankind. You're plunging the depths of your soul and you're giving people these gifts. That's what it's about. I, I mean, especially in those days, nobody got rich. I mean, nobody got rich. People barely made a living who were the abstract expressionists. <clears throat> a lot of them were wealthy to begin with, but those that weren't were living in the East Village, were showing their work in the 10th Street galleries. Um, they had no money. Jenny, my wife, I'll show you this later. We have it upstairs. She was just at a show at Pace Cowan. The Gottlieb show? No. Oh. The Happening show. Oh, oh, okay. When she was 12 years old. She was in The Happening. <clears throat> she was in one of the videos, and she's in the catalog. And um, when she was a kid, she knew all of these people who are now enormously wealthy, right? But in those days, nobody had any money. That's okay. So it wasn't a matter of getting rich. It was a matter of doing the right thing. It was a matter of giving your gifts to the world. And uh, when I heard that John Kennedy died, I just walked out of that store. I went home. I grieved with my parents, my brother, who watched the funeral on television. Everything at that point changed, <clears throat> like 911. And my parents took a trip. When the dust cleared at the end of the year, the holidays, in early January, my parents took a trip to Israel. And they left me and my brother and I had my studio, and uh, it got really cold. We had no heat. We had no hot water. I found myself up in the Bronx a lot, staying in my parents' house. I had an altercation with my brother, and I said to myself, I'm fucking out of here, man. I'm going to L.A. where it's warm. And I went looking for Gary Moore. When I was in Woodstock, back in the summer of 62, I met this kid named Gary Moore. He was a local. And Gary was the only kid I knew who had a car. So all of us, strange group, musicians, artists, We'd hang out with Gary and we'd ride the street, you know, the roads at night and do all kinds of stuff. And we'd go to the artist cemetery. Sometimes I'd sleep in the cemetery. We'd go to the Sea Wolf. I'd have to sneak in. I was only 15. And we'd go. I met some incredibly strange and weird artists in Woodstock. Clarence Schmidt on top of a mountain. Gary introduced me to Clarence. Um, it was one of, <clears throat> one of the only people who actually got into invited into Clarence's house that he had built into the side of this mountain. Um, and uh, Gary was this really great guy, really great looking guy, had all these artist friends. And he had drifted down to New York City. <coughs> <So> <coughs> <clears throat> By the winter of 63, he was living on the street. He was shooting dope. And he looked like he was going to die. And I made him promise that if I went to California, he'd come with me. And so when I decided to go to California, I went looking for Gary. I found him on the street. And he refused to come. 
And so I went to L.A. by myself. And um, a few months later, Gary died. One of the casualties of those days. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of kids I knew didn't know what to do with themselves, and they wound up shooting heroin, and they wound up not surviving. Um, 